you very much. Thanks, thanks very much for um, when we talked about the format for for this evening. Um, Gordon suggested instead of that instead of doing a big talk, because we better kind of think of it in terms of a discussion. So I just do a short introduction and then we kind of take it from there. But I suspect he was thinking, well, we'd be lucky if we get five or six people along, so it's obviously the best format. And, but anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll stick to that. And um, So I'm not really going to launch into a big thing. The main, the, the main, the main thing I want to say is, is really... Um, it's really what a, you know, thanks very much, and really what an honor it is to be here. And I think one of the, one of the really nice things about writing a book called Crack Capitalism, or about writing, writing about the cracks, the breaks in the texture of, of, of capitalist domination, is that then I get invited. I get invited to these cracks. And, you know, and uh, you know, and they're wonderful. You know, the, these cracks, these dignities, these kind of spaces of of refusal and creation. You know, these spaces where people assume the responsibility of their own humanity and say, well, here, in this space, we shall decide how things should be done. We shall do things according to what we consider necessary or desirable. We <coughs> shall assume our own responsibility and we shall make our own mistakes. But what we won't do is kowtow to authority. What we won't do is kind of bow down and say, yes, sir, yes, sir three bags full, sir, so that then we can have the luxury at the end of the day of pointing the finger and saying, well, it really wasn't our fault, it was their fault, as we all join in the digging of the mass grave for humanity that we seem to be embarked upon at the moment. So it's really fantastic then and you can kind of see, not only see or read about these spaces of, 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 of these cracks, but actually get, get invited to them. And it's always very exciting. And, 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 and really, thank you very much. I've been reading all about Free Hetherington, and that seems to me fantastic what you're doing. And it's, it's really lovely to be here. And one of the things, one of the things, I like a lot about um, it, I suppose, is the way the way in which it seems to me Free Hetherington has turned defence into attack, you know, if, if, if I understand right, anyway. That when the university closed the, the Hetherington Research Club, um, you, some of you, I suppose, didn't just say, you know, please, please come back, please open it up again. But you actually took it into your own hands and said, no, here, we will take over the space, you can't do it. You know, we will take over the space and we will use this space in a way that seems to us to make sense. You know? We shall do something else for us. We shall do, make with this space a real um, space that, 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 points towards, if it's not completely self-determining, at least it pushes towards self-determination. Now, here we have a space, not just to call the authorities back, but a space, an opportunity to occupy and to push against and beyond the university as it exists. And that seems to me very important. It's very important because if we think of the, the crisis of capitalism, it seems to me that the crisis of capitalism is really a kind of process of contraction of capital, but contraction in order, in order to attack, in order to restructure. 
No? Capital contracts. It says, oh, well, we can no longer afford things like the Hetherington Research Club. What was it called? Hetherington Research Club. We can no longer afford <coughs> schools that don't... You know, we can no longer afford, what is it, modern languages and social sciences and philosophy. We can no longer afford to give free health care. We no, can no longer afford to think of free universities. No? So there's a kind of contraction. And that contraction really presents us, I think, with two options. And the first option is the kind of obvious option, in a way, um, where we say, no, no, please, pl please come back. Please come back, please, Capital. No, I, we know we've been nasty in the past, but, but really we love you, so please come back. You know. Please give us back our jobs. Please flow back into the universities. Please shape education, shape the health service. Please come back to us. You know. And that is kind of, I suppose, the, the politics simply of, of, of resistance, of please... You know, saying, no, no. Uh, it's a politics of defence, isn't it? You know, everything was fine. Everything was fine. Please don't attack us. You know, everything is all right. Go away. Well, or don't go away. Come back, rather. You know? And the other response when capital contracts is to say, please, go away. We really don't, never wanted you here, capital. You know? Push off. Go to hell. We hate you. We, and so when capital <coughs> contracts, we see that as an opportunity to step forward and occupy the space that capital has left vacant. And I think that that is what, it seems to me, is what <coughs> the Hetherington is all about. I mean, capital has contracted here, and you have stepped forward and said, great, no, we don't want this to be a space dominated by the vice chancellor and the university management. We will take it over and we will use that space in a different way. We will turn it around. And turning it around means turning it against authority. And that means turning it against, against capital. No. And that. <coughs> That seems to me really the challenge of, that is posed for us in, in the crisis. I mean, I don't, obviously I don't want to say there, there, there are, it, that it's an easy solution or that it's always possible. But there are, you can think it's not only free headwind in fact. You want to begin to think, well, you know, where else do we see examples <laughs> of that where Cap in capital re you know, contracts, and instead of calling it back, we rush in and we take it over and we turn it around and we turn it against capital. Then, I don't know, the examples that occur to me are things like factory <coughs> occupations and especially the wave of factory occupations in Argentina and other parts of South America over the last 10 years, where employers said, well, no, we, do we, we withdraw. And the workers then say, fine, go, we don't want you back. We will take it over. And we will not only take it over, but in many cases as well, we will do with this factory or this space what we consider important or necessary. We will turn it against the system. We will make it not, we will turn it from a factory into a space where we can create things that we consider important and we will turn it into a centre of <laughs> resistance against capital, a centre of, 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 of opposition. And you can think as well of the, I don't know, of the landless movements in Brazil as well, where they say, well, it's perf we're perfectly entitled to occupy any land that is not being productively and so they've occupied what several hundred they've had several hundred several hundred thousand occupations over the years where they just take over the land and say well we will use this land and we won't turn it into an agribusiness we will do it according to our own principles according to our own ideas as a basis for 
for for for for for our our life our living our livelihood, or you can think. I mean, another another example, I suppose, would be would be um, squatting. You know? Again, where there's a long established tradition of taking over buildings that are not being used and inhabiting them, or community gardens where people take over derelict sites and turn them into gardens. <coughs> and I think that, that that's very important that you don't, you kind of say where there's a space. We, we take the initiative and we try and turn that space around or that moment, moment around. But not just that. I mean, not, I'm not suggesting just as we should occupy abandoned spaces, that, but that in some sense we need to move out from there. We need to think of those occupied spaces not just as autonomous spaces, which sometimes suggests a kind of a closure, you know, that here in this building we will do our own thing, but actually think of it as being... as. And this is what I understand from what I've read of, of, of Free Hetherington. Now, to use that space, think of that space not just as a closed, a closed space where we do our own thing, but as a centre of revolt, a centre of resistance, a centre where we actually show in practice what the university can be and try and move out from there and try and, you know, if in this space there is a kind of a turning of the university on, on, the, on its head or a turning of, of the university against itself, then you begin to think, well, why, why just here? You know, why not do it all over the place in the <coughs> university? Because the university certainly needs it. You know, it certainly needs to be turned on itself. Turn, turned against itself. And if you, if you think in that way, I mean, if you think then of, of free Hetherington, you know, maybe I'm romanticizing, but I'm, I don't think so. And anyway, I'm happy to romanticize. <laughs> I mean, if you think of free Hetherington in that way, it's a kind of a turning, a turning around, a turning, you know, what is kind of presented to us or presented to you as a challenge of defence, no? In other words, in a sense, the university administration says, we'll close that down, no? And they already, of course, take into calculation that there will be a response saying, defend the Hetherington Research Club. You know, but you turn it around and you say, well, no, we're not going to defend it. We are going to take it over and do something else. If you think of that in relation to the universities, you know, I mean, that it seems to me it's the, it's the challenge. I mean, it's the way the universities are under attack at the moment, you know, the, from you know the way in which the government or the way in which capital is saying, you know, universities as they are are really not very good. We need to restructure them. Restructure them. We need to give them a different direction. And the great danger there is that we defend them and say, oh, no, no, don't touch us. You know, we, we're, we are very good. You know. But if we follow the, the, the lesson of, 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 of the Hetherington, at least as I understand it, we, we shouldn't say that. We should actually say, yes, you're perfectly right. You know, the universities are awful. The universities are awful and they're getting worse and worse and worse, you know. And I suppose I feel this just so strongly. I mean, coming back to Scotland or coming back to Britain after, after years of not teaching here. And you feel, no, I mean, this is absolutely awful what has been happening. So, so you, you sh you know, the response should be, you know, yes, government, yes, capital, you're perfectly right. Universities are <coughs> dreadful places. They are not the places of intellectual excitement that they really should be. And they are not places where we are disco discussing the important problems. No? We really want to discuss the important problems of uh, talk about the future of humanity. But if we're going to talk about the future of humanity, it's not enough just to talk about sustainable development. It's not just and not enough just to set up a department, faculty of the environment, or to, you know, not just 
enough to make it a little bit greener. We have to be really honest. And if we're honest about the, the future of humanity, then the most obvious thing is that we are trapped into a dynamic, a deadly, destructive, suicidal dynamic. And the suicidal dynamic has a name, and the name that we usually give to it is capitalism. So if we're really going to try and make sense of the university, we have, and you know, if we really want to restructure the university, let's take that as the central pro principle. The central principle of saying, well, how on earth do we get rid of capitalism? How on earth do we break this dynamic? How do we turn, you know, turn the university against what it is <coughs> at the moment. And that, in other words, the, there's one that Gordon sent me um, a little article about Free Hetherington. You know, it said that at one point, you know, we're not just into, I think, it, it, you know, we're a center of resistance, but not just of I think it says reactionary <laughs> resistance, or the resistance that simply resists, resists. But you know, we understand resistance as 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 creation, as opening up new things. So that, you know, in that sense, it seems to me that Free Hetherington kind of throws down a challenge, doesn't it, to the university? Not just within this space, but the qu question is, how do we turn the university around? How do we? do that in one area after another, in one seminar after another, in one lecture after another, in one department after another, how do we actually say, well, look, if we really want to talk, if we really want to make the university relevant again, let's talk about how we can get rid of this deadly dynamic that has us in a stranglehold. <laughs> You know, that we really don't know how to break, but we know we have to break it if there is to be any future for humanity. Let's devote our work in the university, in other words, to something sensible. And the only sensible thing is really how do we break that? How do we break capitalism? How do we turn the university around little by little, perhaps, crack by crack? Um, but that, 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 it seems to me, is... is, is is really the challenge that, 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 that is posed to us by, or at least that I like to see is being posed by, by, by Free Hetherington. Um, you know, and it's happening, it's not just here, of course. I mean, this is wonderful, and maybe, you know. But, but it's, and I, I, I don't know all that much about what's going on in other universities in, in Britain, but it does seem to me <coughs> that there are people you know, despite all that's been happening, there are people pushing in the opposite direction, and often kind of under the level of individual courses or um, individual theses or whatever, but also things like the, the really open university in Leeds, things like, um, I don't know, the MA in activism and social change also in Leeds that I'm attached to at the moment. Like the things that are seem the the, the the experiments that seem very interesting that are going on in the University of Lincoln, and and obviously you know far more than I do about other about other examples, but to think of Free Hetherington then in in that context, not just as a at least that's the way I understand it, not just as a space, but really in in <coughs> in, in the context of the challenge that is posed to us at the moment which is really how do we turn the university around? We, because we happen to be in the university, that's why it's posed to us. Now our problem isn't how do we go out to the slums and mobilize the working class. No, our problem is here we are. Here we are in the university. We are being attacked. We act, what we do actually has an impact on the future of humanity. How do we turn it around? How do we respond to that, that attack, not just by defence, but by pushing it back in their faces and saying, no, here we don't accept, and not only do we not accept, but we are going to create what we think is necessary, what we think is enjoyable. Um, 
which is all really a way of saying thank you very much. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic to be here. Mm -hmm. that's, that's it. So for the next half hour or so, questions, contributions, clarifications, maybe if you catch mine, we'll maybe take three at a time and then give John a chance to respond if that seems reasonable. Hiding down there, just listening to you. Oh, fuck, man, I'm making myself warm. Thanks for coming along here, and thanks to God for, for, for setting up and for being here. I'm really delighted to be able to have this conversation with you because I'm a, a big admirer of what, what I've read of your work. But I've got a couple of, um, couple of questions or, or, or hesitations or notes of caution or something. I just wanted to air with the room or to put to yourself as well, John. Um, first is about what you were just saying just there about calling back capital. Because as I see it, part of one of the huge achievements of the Free Hetherington and the people involved in this has been in weaving the front line of a grassroots uh, campaign against the cuts, which could be framed within a language of calling back capital. It's about saying, no, you won't cut modern languages funding or uh, continuing education or, or standing in solidarity with staff and lose their jobs, you know? And I think that's, um, that's been one of the huge achievements of that. And so I would caution against writing off those kind of activities and campaigns that could be characterised as calling back capital, demanding that capital continues to put its money somewhere that we see value. Um, so that's one thing, that's one thought. And my other thought is about something that you wrote in Stop Making Capital, in, the, in Crack Capitalism, the bit that you get on to Stop Making Capitalism. And I, I was debating this with my friend the other day, and I'm just going to, if I may, quote something at you, quote your own words at you. And you write, we are presented with a pre-existing capitalism that di dictates that we must act in certain ways. And to this we reply, no, there is no pre-existing capitalism. There's only the capitalism that we make today or do not make, and we choose not to make it. And I think that's brilliant. I think that's really inspiring. But I also think, and this is what I was sharing with my friend the other day, I think there is, though isn't there? There massively is this huge monolith of pre-existing capitalism that conditions our behaviours and our relationships with each other and with, and with the world. And, and what the person I was speaking to put to me was he suggested that in that <coughs> sentence John Holloway is uh, dancing a slight jig of disingenuousness <laughs> for rhetorical purposes. And so I'm not sure if you are or not, and I wanted to open that out and see if you could speak to that idea of a pre-existing capitalism a little bit and clarify yeah. some of that for, for me. <laughs> Cheers. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what I'm thinking is, we see this crisis of capitalism, it's very different from the one that first got me involved in the movement. I'm talking about 30 years ago. No, it's, this is a different beast. This is definitely a different beast. And I'm thinking that 30 years ago, under Thatcher, in Britain, they done in, you know, the big industrial industries like shipbuilding, mining, all that was done. And I remember at the time this guy had come over from America, Ian, and he did, in, he did in the steel industry in America. He came to Britain and he did in the mines. Do, 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 do. Mm -hmm. So that Ian happens. McGregor. McGregor. Yeah, that was the guy, yeah. Well, 30 years on, that cap, cap, you could argue that capitalism always goes into crisis, and it does. Obviously, it feeds on getting into crisis, then there's masses of unemployment. Masses of cutbacks, the doing the service student, everybody gets it. But this is a different beast. This one, 30 years later, is something I've never experienced. I mean, now it gave us, because of that whole industrialisation that they did, you know, we've got the consumer society, you know, the McDonald's, do, 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 do. But they're going for it big style now. They're actually taking away the welfare state. And it is all about the benefits. It's about people who are disabled, people who are blind, people who are deaf people who are losing care packages. So we're talking about even then, they didn't, they, 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 ate a, they, they chipped away at that then, but they wouldn't launch a full onslaught assault then, but now they're doing it and they're not caring anymore. Uh, so I think this is very, very different. Also, it's different with the, this capitalism from the really bad time under Thatcher 30 years ago to this, this beast. It's like, they are going for universities. You know, I'm a, I, I came here as a student a few years ago and actually couldn't afford to stay and I had to drop out after because of cuts and stuff, I was the cuts. 
But I used to use this place, and I got a lot of creativity from using this place before it, before it was closed. But my understanding is, in this place, they're going for courses that, you know, particularly women do social work, nursing, <coughs> and the languages and all that, but yet the military research is going up. The funding and all that, mm. so we can see exactly where they're going. You know, the word empowerment keeps coming into my head. Every time they launch an attack on us, usually we can preempt it, and we can, you know, we can diversify or get organised. The, the example I can give you how they're organising just now. I live in Clyde Bank, which is part of Western Bartonshire. Now, previously, when there was cutbacks, previously, us the community knew about them. They knew about them. They were going to cut, but this time. The councillors and the MPs who are, you know, in my understanding, they're part of capitalism. They are now making these cuts and not telling the public. In our area, they've closed three libraries in the most disadvantaged areas in Clyde Bank, the poorest area, they've closed three libraries. They stopped free school meals for kids attending the schools. They slashed budgets to day daycare for the elderly and disabled. Now, this is before the big cuts come. The big cuts have still to come. This is just the wee cuts just now. Now what's interesting about how ruthless these councillors and capitalists and MPs did this, they actually implemented the cuts but didn't say where they were going. Now for us as a community, we could do what you have did in the Hemington, you know, which is brilliant, absolutely fantastic. We could have organised, we could have let the press know locally, we could have let, we could have let all the community groups know your library's getting shot, your kids not getting free school meals anymore, the elderly are not getting their We could have did all that, we couldn't because they did it on the day. They did it on the day. They went in on the day, and that was to stop any trade union action, any solidarity, any letters of dissent to the newspapers. That was to stop local people maybe getting involved in occupations of libraries and no dissent whatsoever. And the only time that, and this is what they're going to do in the future, the only time that people knew these things had happened was on the Monday morning. When the child went to get the meal, you don't get the meal anymore. Sorry. The person went to the library to hand back their books or get their CD out, closed. You know, that's very, very clever. They're actually anticipating the fight back. And all I can say is it's empowerment. We have to find more ways to empower. But as that had been in the 80s under Thatcher, we would have knew about it. And we would have occupied, or we would have let the community know, we would have had local demonstrations, we would have bombarded letters to the press, we would have got the, the kids to do it. But so they're, they're acting clever, they're playing clever as well now which I think is interesting. Just the last thing, the difference between obviously 30 years ago and now, environmental issues, that didn't exist. You know, when I was young, it's that, that to my knowledge, none of that existed. The, the global warming, the climate change, that didn't exist, and I'm sure it was happening, and I'm sure there was knowledge and information that all that was happening. I now know about it in the last few years. That is going to be really, really concerning in the future, and I think we know that. But I, I feel optimistic, you know. I still feel that People are organising, and what's the different ways? Even though they shut the doors on us, we will find a way to resist what they're doing to us. Whether it's the welfare benefit cuts, whether it's the hospitals closing, universities, schools, it doesn't matter what they do, we will find a way, I think, to empower people. And that, you know, I think the empowerment is going to be the way that we can do it. We can do it in the other ways that we're, that we're known to us. Okay, take one more, and then back to John, and then we'll... Oh, sorry, uh, on your... I hope I'm not sort of cutting on the discussion. I came in a wee bit late, so you might already have covered this, um, but it's just sort of vaguely carrying on from the last point there um, about ecological uh, movements and sort of those concerns. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if it's your area at all because I've got not that much familiarity with work. I must apologise for that. Um, I was wondering if you had any views on deep ecology and, and its sort of relevance to, to social movements and how far you agreed with uh, Murray Butchin's contention. The deep ecology is just a black hole of half baked, ill formed, <laughs> half digested <laughs> ideas. <laughs> okay. Right. Um, the, the first. Ah, oh, there you are. You're kind of hidden, aren't you? Um, yeah. The, 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 um, I think what you said is very important about calling. The, the, yeah. Uh, 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 the danger in the way that I presented it. No? I'm. Okay. Obviously, we are under attack. No? There is a huge, I mean, the existence of capital is a constant aggression. But a crisis is an intensification of that aggression. And what we have at with the, the moment with the cuts and the conservative government is yet another intensification of that aggression. 
Right. We defend, as you said, we, we fight back in all sorts of ways. Great. You know, we should fight back in all sorts of ways. In love, but what I'm saying is that it's probably helpful. Defense, of course, part of that fight back is simply defense. What I'm trying to say is, fine, but we need to go beyond that defense. No. Um, and in relation to the attack on the health service and schools and the cuts and, and what you said about the fees, one way that it seems to me we can think of that is to think that really the creation of the welfare state, such as it is, in the first place, is really the result of huge struggle, you know, direct and indirect, I mean also partly through people fighting in the war or whatever, a huge struggle to push back the rule of money. So it wasn't so much, you know, please state come in, it was more please money go out. You know, we want to be able to go to the doctors without paying, we want to go to the school to send our children to school without paying. You know? And what we and that kind of so that, that if we think of it as push back the rule of money, then push back the rule of money already means at, at least for it can mean, you know, we have to think of alternative forms of, of social cohesion. But this kind of push back the rule of money is, is central. And obviously ever since the inception of the welfare state, and because of the way it was set up as well, there is an encroachment again of money that is now, now, now being accelerated. But I, think, I suppose I think of, of the struggle to go beyond the, the, the welfare state as being, OK, let's take up the banner again of push back the rule of money. And that is something that unites us, but doesn't just set us into a defensive, a defensive context. You know? um, and that, I think that's what we do all the time. In fact, I mean that, that for me, that I suppose is really the essence. I suppose of the crack, you know, is is the the drive to push back the rule of money or drive the rule of money out of our lives out of certain activities about how to, to, to destroy it, to destroy money as the determinant of what we do. And very often even if we say, well, we want money, which of course we do because we have to live, we have to survive, we enjoy nice things perhaps, no, we, we, we have projects. We may want money, but usually we want money as a way of um, is, uh, as a way of not having money as an obstacle to what we actually want to do. You know? So if, if I'm starving and, 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 and I see there's food there, obviously I want money in order to buy the food, but I would be actually much happier if, if money didn't exist as a mediation. You know? um, you know, so I think one way of thinking of the unity maybe of these struggles, because my intention is certainly not to be divisive, one way of thinking of the, the unity of the struggles is, is in terms of push back the rule of money. Okay, that's, you know, which obviously means push back the rule of the banks, push back the rule of the rich, but it's more than that. Push back the rule of money as a way of social organisation. And that, that kind of it, it challenges us to think of other ways of social organisation. You know, how do we organise without having money there in the middle? Well, here we are. That's what we're doing this evening. You know? um, so the other thing about the, 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 um, yeah, the pre-existing capitalism, I suppose, yes, the central part of my argument is really to say, well, that we have to think of, of I mean, if we think that, 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 that we create capitalism, okay, capitalism doesn't exist because it was created 200 years ago or 300 years ago. Capitalism exists because we're creating it today. Once you get, think of that, <laughs> then the whole question of revolution changes. And I think it changes in a very important way because it's no, you think of revolution then not in terms of how do we abolish capitalism, which, which is a frightening question because it just seems 
so overwhelming and so impossible. But the real question is, how do we stop making capitalism? Okay. Which is also, I mean, a difficult question. We don't have the answers. But at least that, I think, makes it much easier to go in and start thinking in new ways about how we, how we can think, think, think about revolution. Now, if you say, well, yes, but of course pre-existing capitalism is there. We're all raised in it. We all have, you know, we're all confronted with the, the existing relations of power, if you like. We're all confronted with the fact that if we don't sell our labour power or if we don't... Um, go through all the hoops that capital requires, then, then how are we going to survive? And I think that's right. But the, the challenge of revolution is, is really how do you break that? I mean, how do you, how do you, how do you break? Sometimes I think of it in terms of, of a firing squad, to take an extreme example. I mean, a firing squad, some poor person up against the wall who's going to be shot you know, and you've got a firing squad lined up against them you know. okay. the moment before this person is shot how can we think of breaking that dynamic okay. the only the way of breaking it is probably through, through a process of refusal and creation no. We refuse to shoot him, we turn and shoot the officer instead, or we just throw down our guns or whatever. And to us, that's, the problem is that to us very often that, that seems ridiculous. But if you look at it from the other side, if you look at their perspective, and then you suddenly realise that in fact an enormous percentage of the world's population devote their time to ensuring that we do actually carry out what is expected, expected of us. You know, that we very often tend to say, well, yes, I mean, we don't have any option. But then we look around and we see all the policemen, you know, policemen and police women there. And, you know, why are they there if, if, if we don't have any option? <laughs> you know? And all the psychologists and perhaps all the teachers and all the parents and all the people who train us to behave in certain ways. And that there's this kind of enormous apparatus of control. What is it as well that, well, I don't know, I suppose maybe there are other things in the university as well, but a lot of university activity is also directed towards that, to reproducing these systems of thought and system of control. Well, why does so much effort go into to, to, to doing that if, in fact, our readiness to reproduce the system is not in doubt? No? In other words, yes, we have to try and open up this kind of time that seems to be closed. We have to open us and say, well, no, that is our power. Our power is the power to refuse and create. No. That, that's, and that means part of that is saying we have to break the idea of a pre-existing system that is just there and say, fine, there are all sorts of pressures on us to recreate that system, but our power is our refusal to, to recreate it. And so our power is that we may n decide not to produce capitalism tomorrow. Um, and that is actually what we do. We do it. We do it all the time, and we do it interstitially. I and mean, that is precisely the idea of, of, of the crack. This, is you know, here in Free Hetherington, I suppose you decided. Well, here, no, we're not going to. You know, everybody expects us just to go through all the university hoops. But here we're going to do something else. We're going to discuss in a different way, learn in a different way, think in a different way about the meaning of, of studying. No? Um, which I think is a lot, uh, that has a lot to do, sorry, with, with, uh, with your, your question, as I understood it as well, and, and the question of, of empowerment. I suppose the question of, um, 
you know, yes, people are organizing in lots of different ways. And yes, the crisis is really nasty and vicious at the moment. And yes, of course, defense is part of the struggle against what's happening. But empowerment for me means that we have to go beyond the fence and kind of turn the situation around and, 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 and make it ours. Um, and the question then on, on, on deep ecology, you're kind of too deep really there for me to, to see you. Um, I, um, I don't know. I suppose on the one hand, I think that, on the one hand, I, I suppose I'm not really sure what deep ecology means exactly. Um, I'm kind of not very well versed in the ecology literature. On the other hand, it does seem to me clearer and clearer and clearer, you know, what you, that, you, know, what you mentioned as well, is that there's, been a, there's a radical change in our critique of capitalism over the last 30 years. But we now see that one of the urgent reasons for saying we have to get rid of capitalism is that capitalism is destroying the preconditions of human existence. And we can't think of, of the response just in terms of what we will do after the revolution, but we have to think of it actually in terms of creating here and now um, different relations, not only with other people, but also different relations with non-human forms of life. Um, so th that, yeah. Take another three here, here, and Neil. Yeah. Uh, thanks, John. Thank you, Claudia, and um, for your Edmonton as well. Um, I guess my question relates to the multiplier effect. Where, um, where, of course, there's the cracks, but how can we make it splinter in the sense? Where's the kind of um, uh, Achilles heel? And I know there's no one answer either, and I know we don't obviously want to give the exact game away, but where. <laughs> Of course, um, with a, such a sense of urgency and with so many interconnected things, where would you say, tangibly, in the UK today, and, I, and again, I'm obviously aware of uh, security issues, um, <laughs> yeah, and, um, where, where is the focus, where is the pressure points, where can we collectively use that power to crack it, but not just crack it, but splinter it? Okay. Right. Like I come from a slightly different background. I'm more interested in this artistically. So I'm interested to know, um, considering the post fordist economy, knowledge economy that I think we live in, um, I see higher education as commodifying knowledge and something that we possess. Um, so I was just kind of wondering what your thoughts were on that and, um, and what you think about artistic interventions such as the Copenhagen Free University and Oliver Ressler's alternative, alternative, alternative economies and alternative structures. Yeah, just um, like being crack capitalism, then I saw the central pivot, as you describe it, or as Mark described it, is this dual character of labour in the question of concrete, <laughs> or as you call it, doing, and abstract labour. And I just think it would be interesting. I think I'd be interested in that being opened up a little bit as a discussion why you think that's important and what kind of ramifications that has for social movements, particularly the labour movement. Okay. The first one, how can, how can we not just crack but shatter capitalism? That's really, um, Eventually. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Not eventually. Um, what, what I usually say when I'm talking about crack capitalism is like, I finish up saying, well, yeah, I do usually finish up saying that, that really the only way to think of revolution today is, is in terms of the creation, expansion multiplication and confluence of these cracks, of these space, of these dignities, of these spaces of refusal and creation. And then people ask, you know, great, but 
how do you think of the confluence? Mm -hmm. How do you bring them together? You know, just really the multiplier effect. You know, how do you, how do they come together with a whoosh? And um, I was at last last night. I was at the presentation of a book by the Free Association called Moments of Excess, and they did this great talk where they say, well, yes, I mean that. That is the question, but we have an answer, no? Yeah. And the answer is fairy dust. <laughs> so we just sprinkle fairy dust on the situation, that gives you the... You know, which I love, so I said, yes, I mean, that's my, I'm going to be my answer <laughs> from now on to all these awkward questions. <laughs> um, but fairy dust, I think, is also a way of saying, well, we don't really know. I mean, um, how do you, how, I think partly these things are always unpredictable. Okay. What actually brings things together and causes explosions of, of, of anger or a huge kind of sh radiation or shooting out of, of struggle, I think is fairly unpredictable. I mean, if you think of North Africa and the, 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 the Arab Spring, then Clearly, the, the, the burning of the, the man in Tunisia was, was, was one thing that kind of set that off. But obviously, that's not the sort of thing that we want to organize. Or, no. um, or if you think of Greece a couple of years ago, in December 2008, there it was the shooting of a 15-year-old boy by the police that suddenly kind of led to an explosion of, of, of rioting and discontent. Um, uh, I think that, uh, firstly then, I think that these things are fairly unpredictable. Um, that what you get, I think, perhaps, is situations of growing tension. You know? And in these situations of growing tension, um, then anything can happen, or something can happen, that will just spark it off. But it, we can, that's not really predictable in advance, and, 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 and it can't be organized in advance. I mean, we have to have a, a humility as well and say, well, maybe in the end of the day, rebellion by definition is something that cannot be organized. Mm. No? Um, in, in Britain at the moment, um, you know, what are these high points of tension? Um, I really don't know. I think you probably, I mean, I don't live here. I mean, I've been here for a couple of months now, but I don't live here, so you probably have a much um, greater awareness of that. I mean, obviously, the whole, the whole cut situation, the whole, um, the NHS, the attacks on the NHS, which I think stir a huge anger amongst a, an enormous percentage of the population now. The, the situation in, in, in the cuts, the, the fees in the universities. I mean, one thing that really struck me and kind of surprised me, well, I don't know if it surprised me, but really struck me was when I was here in November, especially when I was here in Glasgow in November, um, this feeling of anger in the universities, you know, the feeling of people being fed up, people, of pe people being really angry with the situation, you know? and um, that seemed to me, that degree of anger seemed to me something I hadn't noticed um, on previous, pre previous visits. Now, at what <coughs> point that leads to an explosion, I, I just don't know. Um, I was, um, just by chance, in, in um, Argentina two weeks before the 19th and 20th of December 2001, when, you know, the masses, masses and masses of people took to the streets and brought down one president after another. Mm -hmm. And then you could really feel the tension. You could really feel that something was going to happen. But of course, that didn't mean that something would happen. It's just, you kind of felt, well, it's an explosive situation. Um, you know, I think that, I imagine that in Greece, for example, that kind of sense of an explosive situation perhaps exists at the moment. In Britain, not so much, but but who knows? No. 
um, high, higher education is commodified. <coughs> higher, the way the universities work increasingly, I think, is, is, is they're increasingly dominated by the logic of commodification. You know. But there is also a struggle against that. I mean, there are lots of students who don't study just so that they can become a commodity at the end of the day. There are lots of people teaching <laughs> in the universities who actually have ambitions that go beyond um, producing commodities that will sell well. Well, I suppose I'm also looking like Richard Florida's Korean City, the idea of like having creative capital and human capital and using creativity and artistic ability in order to basically provide more uh, services to cities, get corporations to move in, etc. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't talk about that in terms, it seems to me that that's, that, if I understand this at all, is absolutely not capital, you know, that's anti-capital. Um, it doesn't actually help to talk of it as human capital or whatever. Um, but it, it, it's certainly, um, the question is, 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 yes, as I said, how do we turn the universities around? How do we actually turn our daily activity against what they're trying to impose on us? And I do think that the whole question of, of art and artistic intervention is very important in that respect. Because if you, if you think, come to come back to the question of the confluence of these cracks, um, I think one thing we can say is that it doesn't really help to think of the coming together of the cracks in institutional terms. That institutions, I mean, to set up a federation of cracks or whatever, just wouldn't make an awful lot of sense. And, um, that institutional attempts to try and bring together or spark off a conflagration of cracks just don't seem to work. That instead we have to think in terms of resonances, I think. And in thinking in terms of resonances, there I think that, 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 that the, uh, the development of other forms of communication or other forms of thinking and other forms of expression is very important. Um, and that their art, art is very important and that that is one of the things that's been happening over the last 10 or 15 years is the, the realization of that, I think. Um, whereas before, perhaps it was um, it considered to be a kind of a marginal luxury or something, you know, nice on the outside. It's, it, it can now be seen to be more and more, more, more central. Um, <coughs> the question of abstract and concrete labor, my favorite question. <laughs> um, it, yeah, the, the, the argument in the book is an argument in the way that we have to think of these cracks in terms of two contrasting um, forms of activity. You know? That what we do in a place like this is not, we don't perform alienated or abstract labor. We actually develop an activity that we that makes sense to us or that we want to do that's fun for us or we enjoy doing no. okay. and what I do is try and relate that to the dual character of labour which Marx discusses in, 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 in Capital. One way of I'm trying to think of it um, very briefly I think is in terms of flows of determination determination that at the moment we live in a society in which there is a flow of determination from a meaningless center, a meaning, the meaningless center, if you like, is money, that the way in which society is composed creates a flow of determination, a flow that shapes our all social activity and shapes our daily activity. Okay. Now, what we're trying to do in these cracks is to, to, to reverse that flow of determination and say, no, we won't accept this flow of determination that we, that is, we recognize as being meaningless and destructive. We will actually try and flow from here. We shall try and determine what it is that we're going to do. We are going to try and give our own sense individually and collectively, of all collectively, to, to, to our activity. <coughs> and it seems to me that that is perhaps a, a helpful way to think of this antagonism between abstract and concrete labor. Um, yeah, I mean that's, so that, that's what I'm...
kind of into at the moment. But we, said, <coughs> we said we'd take a short break, so if we call it a break for about 10 minutes, then we'll come back and basically repeat the process for another 40, 45 minutes. So, short 10 minutes, right? Yeah.